So welcome everyone, I'm Beth Rebay, the host of the Civics Project and the Director of Repair, which sponsors the Civics Project. And I'd like to begin today's episode on due process, episode 30, with a brief land acknowledgement. So Repair acknowledges the Gabrielina Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to work for the Taraha Tom, the indigenous peoples in this place. We pay our respects to Hanukvatam, the ancestors, Ahihiram, the elders, and Iohinkem, our relatives and relations, past, present, and emerging. So as noted, today's episode focuses on due process. And I wanna start by just defining the concept more clearly because it's a term that we hear a lot of and I don't think it's actually very well understood in US society by the general public. So due process in the simplest terms refers to the requirement that the government respect the rights that belong to individual people or sometimes to families or communities. What rights are protected by due process can vary pretty widely and in context. And due process rights are not afforded to all people in the same ways. Um, and they apply to different kinds of legal questions. So for instance, being arrested without being read your rights would generally be understood as a due process violation. Uh, but it doesn't, but due process violations are not limited to criminal legal context. You could be denied due process, for instance, if you were receiving a benefit from the government, like a disability benefit or social security or an employment insurance, and then it was just taken away with no appeal, with no process at all. Um, so sometimes that would be a violation of due process. Um, it could also be in the context context of things like family law, like having your children removed from your household with no process, no appeal, nothing you could do to restore your parental rights. So the basic idea is that our legal systems have some restrictions on the ways in which they can take away rights, which we are supposed to have under that same legal system. Now, this doesn't mean that your legal rights are you know, always protected in every respect. For instance, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution indicates that we have a right to liberty. Now, if we interpreted that in the most broadest universal sense, no one could ever be put in a prison or jail or detention facility because it would violate your right to liberty. So due process rights don't say that your rights are total and inalienable. Rather, they say that there has to be some somewhat reasonable and fair process by which the government infringes on those rights. So if you have a right, the government has to respect it. That doesn't mean, however, that you couldn't lose some of that right. It just means that there's supposed to be a legal process, usually in, including some right to trial or hearing or appeal um, before you lose access to something that otherwise is legally protected. There's a broad and legal, broad theoretical and practical relationship between the idea of due process of law and equal protection under the law. So equal protection refers to the rights that the idea that people should not be treated terribly differently based on any social status such as sex or race or age or disability or under some law sexual orientation, right? Uh, whereas due process says your rights should not be casually infringed upon with no potential access to appeal, right? But in practice, both of these ideas, due process and equal protection, tend to operate very closely. They're both explicitly referenced in the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which is essentially the foundation of our rights to both due process and equal protection. They're not the only source of it. And so um, often we'll see courts dealing with both questions of due process and equal protection at the same time. Again, they're not the same thing, but they can overlap a lot. And just to cover this again, equal protection refers to not basically experiencing discrimination at the hands of the state or under the color of a, of a law. And due process means that the state can't just casually 
arbitrarily or unreasonably infringe upon any right that's protected under law. Not all due process rights are available to um, everyone. So for instance, some due process rights would only attach to US citizens. Some would attach to, for instance, legal permanent residents or people with green cards, but would not, not attach to people who are undocumented. Uh, and so there can be a difference in access to due process based on your immigration or citizenship status. So much of what we think of as due process today does not, for instance, apply to someone who's in the context of an immigrant deportation hearing. I wouldn't say none of it applies, but a lot of the due process rights that uh, we're in theory all supposed to have don't apply to non-citizens, particularly in that context. In addition, there's lots of ongoing legal questions about like exactly how much of a right to due process do you have? Is it just enough that you're being told why your rights are being taken away? Do you have the right to some sort of hearing? Um, is it different and based on different types of legal questions? And there's no bright line, simple answer to these questions. Instead, it's an ongoing and evolving set of conversations that, that basically plays out through our courts and legislatures. So I wanna devote a fair amount of our time today to looking at some of the major court cases that have led to what we think of as our due process rights today. And I'm gonna go all the way back into the 19th century specifically to a set of cases known as the slaughterhouse cases, which were ultimately decided by the Supreme Court in April of 1873. So these cases all involved the same basic fact, which was that there were slaughterhouses that were located upstream uh, by a body of water in New Orleans. And the slaughterhouses were releasing all of these waste products into the water and it was making people sick was causing health problems for the residents of New Orleans and for and anyone else affected by that body water in Louisiana. So eventually the state of Louisiana decided that it was going to take all the industries and create just one slaughter, slaughterhouse that would be located in one area south of the city of New Orleans. And the slaughterhouse owners were furious and they sued Louisiana, they sued the state and said that this this is basically a state sanctioned monopoly that the state is taking over the industry. And this, they argued that this uh, infringed on their rights under both the 13th and the 14th Amendment. And under the 14th Amendment, they argued that it was a due process violation. So Justice Samuel Miller was writing the opinion for this case and he basically dismissed the claims regarding due process saying that, um, that the citizens of each state are entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the states and to the 14th Amendment, which guaranteed the protection of the privileges and immunities. And he said, okay, all of this gives you a right to due process, but that the 14th Amendment basically protects rights of natural citizenship. And those rights are narrow. They might cover, for instance, things like being allowed to be in the country, being allowed to vote, maybe all of that was also dealt with later in the amendments to the constitution. Um, but he said the due process rights don't mean, or he also mentioned that due process rights included the right to travel freely between states and not to be you know, trapped physically by your government. But he said, due process rights don't mean that you have the right to be protected from a government monopoly, basically. And so the takeaway from this important line of cases was that due process, at least as it was covered under the 14th Amendment, didn't mean that you were protected from anything a government could do. It was limited. It didn't mean, for instance, in this case, that you were protected from a government-sponsored monopoly. And again, while this case was about one particular thing, which is can a government take over an industry, it established that due process rights are limited, right? There's some things governments can do for which the 14th Amendment, at least in 1873, would not kick in. So courts were left over time with the decision of like, okay, when do due process rights apply? If they don't protect you from a government-sponsored monopoly, what do they do? So 
about 32 years later in April of 1905, a new case came up called Lochner versus New York. And the federal courts in this case had to, again, hear a due process claim under the 14th Amendment. So Lochner, the party in Lochner versus New York was a baker. So this again was about business. He was a baker in New York and he was convicted of violating a state act called the New York Bake Shop Act, which was supposed to protect workers. And it said, bakers cannot work more than 10 hours a day or 60 hours a week. So it was a law that was passed to create some labor rights. The Supreme Court decided to strike, strike down that New York law, saying that Lochner had a right to contract protected by law, and that in state law, which infringed on that right, was violating his due process. So they used the 14th Amendment to say labor laws, which restrict the rights of business owners to contract with laborers under whatever terms they want, will violate the 14th Amendment. And this was a decision that was pretty heavily criticized at the time. Many felt that it was exceeding the court's authority to just strike down this New York law. But that was the Supreme Court decision. And in this case, they found that due process does not always protect individual safety and liberty over the corporate or business owner's right to contract. That argument could have gone either way, which is why the court was criticized for it. Like you could have said, um, that, you know, the workers have, um, a, you know, an interest in having their labor rights protected and that the uh, court should not take that away because that would infringe on their due process rights. So we're seeing sort of due process can be a nebulous and evolving concept. But the 1905 decision, uh, Lochner versus New York, according to the Supreme Court, indicated that the right to contract is protected protected by the 14th Amendment, whereas the right to be protected from a government monopoly, as indicated in the 1873 slaughterhouse cases, was not protected. So major questions about the 14th Amendment come up again involving the state of New York 20 years later in Gitlow versus New York. So this is June of 1925, just over 20 years later. And the Gitlow case is an interesting one. So the plaintiff in this case is a man named Benjamin Gitlow, and he's a socialist. So in, in the 1920s, he prints an article saying we should overthrow the government and the state of New York arrests him for it. And he argues that he should have been protected under the First Amendment. And the Supreme Court says that yes, First Amendment's rights are protected by the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, so the court says that the 14th Amendment can kick in if the government is infringing on your First Amendment rights. So like the right to contract, the right to speech is protected. However, Gitlow still lost his case. He didn't lose on the due process question. But the court still held that the state of New York was allowed to arrest him because there was an exception in the First Amendment that exists in the courts called the clear and present danger test. So this applies to, for instance, yelling fire in a crowded theater. And the court basically found that Gitlow saying we should overthrow the government was uh, causing, causing a clear and present danger. And therefore, while he had a First Amendment right, which is protected by due process, his First Amendment right stopped at the point where he was causing a danger to others. So this was the first ruling in which, but of many that were to come, in which basically other rights indicated in the, the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the constitution were understood as being protected by due, pro due process. They couldn't be infringed upon lightly. So what was very important about this case as a precedent is it tells us that your constitutional rights will override state and municipal law. So if a state or a city or a county passes a law which will take away a constitutional right, then you have a right to challenge that both based on that right and on due process that the government is supposed to respect your rights. So your constitutional rights are protected, right to contract is protected, protection from a government monopoly, not so much. 
want to jump ahead about, oh, let's see, 36 years, June of 1961. This case in, in, originated in Ohio, and the name of the case is MAP versus Ohio, and that's MAP with two Ps. So this was the case that established a famous example of what we now think of as due process rights, which was the right to be protected from an illegal search and seizure. So before June of 1961, if the police illegally seized something or illegally searched you, they could be subject to penalties. They could be fined, they could be reprimanded, but whatever evidence they got from that illegal search and seizure could still be used against you. The Map versus Ohio decision in 1861 changed that and said, if you are subject to an illegal search and seizure, which violates your constitutional rights, then anything that the police get from that or any law enforcement get from that unlawful search and seizure cannot be used against you in a criminal or other proceeding. And so it would be excluded from trial. And this basically said our Fourth Amendment rights to privacy um, are now further protected by the 14th Amendment right to due process. So MAP versus Ohio is why. If the police illegally search you, they can't use the evidence, or at least they're not supposed to be allowed to use the evidence against you in a criminal proceeding. In practice, we know courts do not always strictly adhere to that, but that is the federal and constitutional rule. Just a couple of years later, the court decided Gideon versus Wainwright. So before this case, if you were poor, you didn't have a right to legal counsel, despite the fact that the Sixth Amendment uh, gives you a right to legal counsel in, the, in a criminal proceeding. So you could hire uh, a lawyer for, you know, to defend you from any criminal charge, but if you couldn't afford one, then the law didn't step in to protect you. So the only thing basically the Sixth Amendment had been interpreted to do was to give you a right to hire an attorney to defend you in a criminal case if you had the money to do it. So Gideon versus Rain Wainwright involved plaintiff Gideon, who was a resident of Florida. He'd been charged for breaking and entering into a pool room to commit a crime. He was poor. He asked if the court would appoint attorney, an attorney for him. The court said no, and said that the only time in which Florida law gave you a you know, right to have an attorney given to you despite your ability, notwithstanding your ability to pay, was if you'd been charged with a capital crime such as murder, right? So since this was a more petty offense under Florida law, Gideon had no right to uh, be represented uh, without having to pay. And so then he had to represent himself and he lost and he appealed saying, hey, I've got a due process right to have my constitutional rights, including my sixth amendment right, to counsel in a criminal proceeding uh, respected by not providing me with attorney, an attorney, the sixth and 14th amendments were violated. And the court agreed. They said due process when it's applied to the sixth amendment means that uh, you have to be able to have access to an attorney in a criminal proceeding, whether or not you can afford to pay for them. So this created a right to counsel regardless of your ability to pay, 1961. Lots going on in this time period. Just four years later, June of 1965, we see Griswold versus Connecticut. And this further expanded the ways in which we think about due process. So this case involved a woman named Estelle Griswold. Was Griswold. She was the director of a Planned Parenthood clinic in Connecticut. And the state arrested her for violating a law which said you cannot give counseling or birth control to married people, right? So if, if someone is married, you're not allowed to counsel them or give them about birth control or give them birth control. So Connecticut basically had a birth control ban once you get married. They wanted married people to keep having babies. So the Supreme, this case went up to the Supreme Court again. And the question they had to think about was basically a right to privacy. And they had to consider, does the constitution give people an individual right to privacy, which would be violated 
if they were denied access to counseling privately with a healthcare provider. So in other words, what Griswold was challenging was the law itself. She was saying, yes, I violated this law, but this law violates a constitutional right to privacy and therefore it should be struck down under the 14th Amendment. So the court here had to decide, is there a constitutional right to privacy? The, right, the word privacy does not show up in the Constitution and specifically in the 14th Amendment or any part of the Bill of Rights. So they had to decide, does the broader language of due process means, mean protect a right to privacy? Do we have that under sort of the broad frames of life or liberty or equal protection? And the court decided, we think that it does. So 1965, the Supreme Court says, yeah, the state just can't step in and decide what you can talk about with your doctor. And the Griswold case then became the foundation in the next decade for Roe versus Wade. So the Roe versus Wade decision later again relied on the idea which the 1965 Supreme Court had established that there is a right to privacy and used that to strike down at the time the Texas law which criminalized abortion. Portion. So as you can imagine, that Griswold decision and the question of whether privacy rights are protected under the uh, 14th Amendment due process clause continues to be a really important area for the court, especially right now when we're seeing, you know, abortion privacy issues come up again. I want to just talk about one last Supreme Court case uh, that's more recent because I didn't just want to stay in the 20th century. <coughs> which added to our existing foundations in due process and equal protection law. And that was the 2015 case of Burgefell versus Hodges. Some of you know that decision. It's the one in which the court recognized that under both the due process and equal protection clause, same sex couples have a fundamental right to get married and states must recognize their marriage if it was licensed in another state. So the due process clause states that no one shall be deprived of life or liberty or property without due process of law. And the, the Obergefell decision basically said, if you're taking away someone's right to marry, you're infringing on their liberty. And the equal protection clause also kicked in and says, we well, you know we have to treat all people the same, so we shouldn't be treating same-sex couples different than uh, heterosexual couples. So this 5-4 ruling in 2015 made same-sex marriage legal across the United States and all of its territories. And again, what this case established that was new in due process law was the precedent that infringing on a person's right to marry violates due process. So again, this is a little bit of our case history and it should start to give you a sense of like how has the meaning of due process been struggled over in our courts and why has it become such an important concept to us? And just to revisit again, due process is about the right of people to have their, their rights respected by the state, whether it's a constitutional right or something else. So one of the biggest problems with due process is that there's enormous disparities in access to the resources that people may need to access due process rights. So I mentioned the Gideon versus Rainwhite decision in the 1960s in Florida, which basically said, even if you don't have the money to hire an attorney, if you're being charged with a crime, you have a right to have an attorney provided to you by your state or municipality. And um, that closed one area in which uh, there was this sort of major disparity in access to due process based on people's economic needs. But what it didn't do is address the fact that A, doesn't have to be a great attorney, and B, that's only for criminal cases. So for instance, in a non-criminal proceeding, let's say for instance, the state has decided that you're not fit to parent your children because you're homeless. And since you can't provide a home for your children, they're being taken away from you. Um, you have no right to an attorney in that case. You might be able to get one, uh, through some kind of local legal aid program, or someone might be able to provide one to you, but there's not a federal legally protected right. It would be up to the state or municipality to decide, do you get an attorney when your kids are getting taken away? Do you get an attorney if um, 
let's say you are being committed to a mental hospital and you want to fight it. Um, so the ability to pay is still a major barrier to exercising our due process rights for many people in legal proceedings. No matter how wrong a government action may be, if you are not able to successfully advocate for yourself in a court, it's very difficult for your due process rights to actually be protected or respected. In addition, we know that discriminatory treatment plays out in all sorts of areas in our legal system, criminal and civil. So one of the things that we see is that um, we've got major disparities in criminal contexts for sentencing. So people who committed the same type of crime may have much more liberty taken away from them than others. So this is both an equal protection issue, but also a due process issue. Um, access to information um, is also often determined in society by how good your school system is. And we know that there's a lot of discrimination that determines how much information people get. So discriminatory treatment and pre-existing structural ways in which people are deprived of money, of information, all of these affect due process rights. We think we can think of due process rights as essentially on paper. Uh, and then individuals have to know enough and have enough to actually materialize and fight for those rights when they're challenged. So it's really important to understand that just because due process rights exist in theory or exist in legal doctrine doesn't mean that we have no instances in which the government gets away with violating people's rights, essentially. Without trying to fully answer what would change that, I'll point to a few things that advocates are have talked about as ways to address major uh, deficits in due process. So remember that the case which established the right to counsel, even if you can't pay for it in the criminal trial, was Gideon versus Rainwright. But it's, it's limited, as noted, only to criminal trials. So some advocates are, say, are saying we should have what are called civil Gideon rights. And they've named it Gideon after that case, after the plaintiff in the Gideon case, and said we should have a right to counsel in at least some forms of civil hearings as well. Um, we should have a right to counsel in anything to do with, let's say, immigration, anything to do with child custody, anything to do with uh, essential, you know, evictions, essential resources that affect your life, for instance, right? So if we've got a constitutionally protected right to life and to liberty, then um, government actions which threaten those would be ones in which you could make a strong due process argument for a right to counsel when interpreted in tandem with the rest of the Constitution. So civil Gideon rights, which do not presently exist across the board, at least everywhere. In some states, um, states will pass, you know, rights to counsel in non-criminal, in certain non-criminal proceedings, but um, there's no federally protected rights, which means depending on where you live, you certainly may not have a right to counsel outside of criminal trial. Violations of due process in law enforcement are, as you know, a major concern and have been repeatedly highlighted by the Black Lives Matter movement and the uh, murders of uh, George Floyd, among many others. And so one argument um, to improve due process is to pass the Breathe Act, which is before Congress, mm -hmm. and if passed, would um, really create a, a fairly comprehensive set of protections against police brutality, including unlawful search and seizure and other violations of due process. I wanted to hold that up as one legislative example, not the only one, which is addressing limitations in due process. A third way to tackle deficits or deficiencies in due process is to expand our social safety net. So if we lift more people out of poverty, then bottom line, we create more ways for people to um, exercise the rights that they have or should have, in essence. And a fourth way in which we might address deficits in due process would be to expand the rights available and accessible to immigrants. And I want to share a book recommendation, and I should say a little bit actually before I get to our book recommendation, to expand immigrant rights and particularly to provide, to just extend 
immigrant right, uh, to extend due process rights to all sorts of immigration claims, including deportation hearings. So on that note, I wanna recommend a book for those who'd like to learn more by Tanya Golosh Boza. And the title of the text is Due Process Denied. Uh, so again, that is by Tanya Golash Boza. Uh, okay, so I will be glad to chat more with our Zoom audience in a moment. Uh, but I want to first um, just invite folks to join us next week for our session on uh, separation of church and state. So that's going to be, um, let's see, what is next week? September 26th. And we don't have our October calendar yet, but we should be having an episode soon on gun violence and some other compelling issues. So I will look forward to seeing you then. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And Zoom audience, we're having a slight technical ditch glitch, so I may log out for a second, but I will be right back. <laughs> 